What's the future for the oil market? Today, we're joined by Josh Young, CIO at Bison Interests. Josh is what I would consider an expert in the oil markets. I've followed his work for some time, uh, and he has accurately predicted uh, a number of changes in the oil market, particularly price movements, but just also events uh, that I found very interesting and, uh, and, and wanted to share with all of you. So I consider Josh an expert. Like I said, we're going to talk about the oil market. Josh, it's good to have you here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So what I wanted to do, though, is just start, you know, you had made some predictions earlier this year about uh, the rise in oil prices, which were very accurate. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. I wanted to get your take on that. Where do you see oil going? You know, if we, we talk generally speaking, where do you see oil going in the next two years? So yeah, uh, <laughs> I like to joke that my short-term crystal ball is broken. So uh, if uh, if I said something earlier this year and it happened, that's sort of I would chalk that up more to luck than to <laughs> skill. Um, but so so what I do at Bison and what we do at Bison is we evaluate macro factors in the oil market as well as analyze hundreds of publicly traded oil and gas and related. Uh, companies and so so the com the combination of those two things has allowed us to over time with a lot of volatility outperform the market um, for for those sorts of stocks as well as um, to get some insights into the market uh, and to likely changes in prices and dynamics that I think others that are just focused either on companies or on oil macro sort of miss. So just, I think it's helpful to understand sort of like where we're coming from. Um, what we're seeing is a few things that make me very, very bullish on the price of oil subject to the world economy cooperating. And so in a scenario where we don't have a hard landing, so where there's not a deep recession in the US, and where that doesn't sort of escalate into a pretty deep global recession. So in a scenario where that doesn't happen, we're materially undersupplied for oil. We've seen significant declines in world oil inventories over the last couple of years, and we're on track, again, subject to there not being a hard global economic landing. Um, we're, we're on track to there being an even more severe oil supply deficit, which should imply much higher prices than we're seeing. And I think there's a reasonable economic case where if that does play out sort of how we're seeing because of uh, significant underinvestment because of growing demand and so on. If that does play out how we're seeing, it could actually be a catalyst for a sort of global economic slowdown because at some oil price that's much higher than the current one, you'd actually see that negatively affect the global economy. So, so if you um, going off of your analysis, then if we don't have a hard landing. Um, you, you could potentially see a rise in oil prices contributing to something of a hard landing, maybe more in the more distant future. Uh, would that be a correct assessment or, or not? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I guess my economic outlook, I smile, but it's sort of uh, unfortunate. I, I sort of think we're either going to have a recession because, you know, we rose, the Fed raised interest rates too much too fast and because we're running a giant fiscal deficit even ahead of a recession. And so, you know, we're sort of in this uh, unstable, unsustainable economic position right now. So either we sort of end up in a downturn sort of in the near future um, from from all this, or uh, we don't, and then our undersupply of oil and certain other commodities sort of forces inflation and forces certain other factors that end up pushing us into a recession. So I think either way, to some extent, it's reasonably likely. And also, I don't think it's a sort of hero call in the sense that historically there have been recessions in the US every, let's say, five to seven years. And there really hasn't been one if you exclude COVID, which was sort of a government manufactured uh, downturn. We have really haven't had an economic downturn since 2009. So it's been it's way overdue. So it's not, <laughs> it's just sort of, hey, like cycles didn't go away. And by the way, there's a decent chance if we don't have a down cycle, we'll end up seeing much higher oil prices, which yeah, could, could force us into a down cycle. Right. Good, good point on that. You know, we are long overdue, if you will, for a recession. Uh, what do you see as far as 
where oil production is going to be the hardest hit. I mean, to say you'd mentioned we're undersupplied right now. We probably will be in the future, which will support higher prices. Where do you see that as being the most acute? Is that here in you know, the States and Canada, North America? Do you see it more in Europe or in Russia or the Middle East? Um, I know the oil market is a world market. I know oil prices are set globally, but uh, are, are there regional areas that you think uh, that that shortage would be more severe than others? Yeah, so so I think there's there's uh, two two aspects to it. So one is a supply question, and then there's sort of a demand and economic impact question. And so from a supply perspective, the places where we're seeing less supply right now than I think uh, sort of the consensus expectation was a year or two ago, we're seeing less supply coming out of Saudi Arabia. And um, at Bison, we've had a theory for a little over two years that, that we published and have been getting all kinds of interesting feedback, feedback on, which is that uh, Saudi Arabia and certain other OPEC countries actually have less production capacity than they report. And um, at the time, it was sort of scandalous and a sort of big deal, but subsequently, they've talked about it. So the Aramco uh, senior executives, along with Saudi oil ministers and various others, have talked about this. Uh, similar to what I'm saying, there being potentially a global undersupply for oil due to underinvestment. So even if they're not acknowledging that they can't actually produce as much as they're saying, they're still identifying the same sort of problem. So uh, I, I view that as sort of <laughs> a partial confirmation, them saying that, in addition to um, this sort of voluntary additional supply cut that Saudi Arabia has been doing uh, now for a few months. And they just announced uh, today at the time of this uh, recording that, um, that they're going to extend that cut uh, that extra voluntary million barrel a day oil production cut uh, through the end of this year and sort of are implying that they might actually extend it into next year. So um, that's a really big cut and that's indicative of a supply shortage. Uh, Russia is actually surprising to the upside. So the consensus was that Russia would have about 2 million barrels a day of supply disruptions by this point from uh, sanctions and other actions after Russia invaded Ukraine. And that has not been the case. Russian supplies are down, but they're down, let's say, roughly 500,000 barrels a day, not 2 million barrels a day. So they're surprising sort of to the upside. And then the one other spot that's that's noteworthy on the supply side, is, um, the, the one spot that's noteworthy is uh, U.S., where we're actually not growing production right now, despite consensus and actually despite this a uh, report that came out this morning from the EIA, which said that we grew production, but the way that these weekly reports are calculated is not um, is not conducive to sort of <laughs> accurate numbers. And so generally the weeklies get turned into monthlies, which are then revised a couple of times. And my expectation is that the number that was reported this morning will get revised down a couple of times, and that we'll see that the U.S. is actually in oil production decline. And this shouldn't be a huge surprise and it shouldn't be radical. The U.S. rig count for oil is down more than 100 rigs year over year. And uh, that, that's a little under a 20 percent decline in oil rigs. And so that's uh, significant enough um, that that should be having a production impact. And it's just not showing up in the numbers yet. So the U.S. is actually a big surprise. And. Again, for the reason why that matters, so the Saudi number is bigger, but the U.S. was actually growing production by a million barrels a day every year for essentially the last decade. And so for the U.S. to go in this post-COVID environment from having grown a million or even in some years, two million barrels a day to shrinking is a really big change. And it matters because oil fields uh, deplete naturally and need to be essentially replaced. So globally, you always need to be adding production just to stay still, but then demand tends to grow by a million to two million barrels a day every year, and, and that's cumulative. So you sort of need to be growing production somewhere or else you end up in a supply deficit like we're seeing. And if you don't grow in response to that and you don't have high enough prices and healthy capital markets to incentivize investment to grow, uh, then you, you can end up in just sort of a, a worse and worse undersupply situation with the potential for radically higher prices. I'm assuming that that the change, that significant shift in U.S. production came kind of in the wake of COVID. Uh, 
with the collapse in oil prices. Is that like an accurate, was that an accurate time where that shift took place? Yeah, so so it was actually starting, shale was starting to roll over. I think it's sort of uh, well productivity peaked around 2018. And then um, activity sort of peaked in late 2019, as I recall, and then was already starting to roll over before COVID. But what I'm talking about in terms of this surprise and this shift, there was a pretty rapid rebound in production after COVID. So after oil prices went negative, a lot of fields got shut in. As they turned back on, you saw production grow from its low point over 2 million barrels a day, from its low point to, let's say, the production level at this point last year. The interesting part is that as the rig count rebounded, um, I think there was this expectation. You still see some sell-side research analysts, so like uh, Citibank is forecasting this, and then some government agencies forecasting a large amount of incremental oil production from, let's say, last year's level to right now. And you even saw it in this week's weekly EIA uh, inventory and production report where they showed a higher number than their number for this point last year, but it's just wrong. And so again, the, the thing that matters, it's not just that the production was slowing and stopping growing a few years ago, it's that there is this market expectation and there are agencies and banks and so on forecasting production growth right now in the US. And so we're off this decade plus trajectory of production growth and there's still this sort of large um, set of expectations for growth that are just not happening. So it's not just that it got thrown off by the COVID era, it's that even now it, there's been this big shift from the trajectory a year ago to today, where with that drop in rigs, there's sort of this change in production dynamic. And I think some of its calculation methodology, some of its, I think, wishful thinking, um, you know, there's no reason to assume malice when incompetence would suffice. And so we'll just say that, you know, <laughs> there's maybe some incompetence there. And, you know, it's just obvious that without a big step, step up in well productivity and drilling productivity, that dropping that many rigs in the last year would just inevitably lead to a production decline. What what would you attribute that to? Like, do you know what the causal factors were behind that most recent drop? Uh, or yeah. is it just something I mean, we're observing? There's a whole uh, world of, of explanations and things. There's I'll share like the top, let's say, three reasons why. Because, of course, these are really big investment decisions. Every well is costing, let's say, 10 or $12 million in West Texas or Southeast New Mexico. Some of these wells cost a lot more than that. Some costs less, but you know each each drilling decision is pretty significant. Hiring a rig for a year, if you drill, let's say, twenty four wells in a year, I mean, <laughs> you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars budgeted just for one well. And we have even with this drop in rig count, um, I think the last number is around five hundred oil rigs, and uh, that's just off of memory. I, I should have uh, checked it before this, but let's say somewhere around five hundred rigs. So we're talking about you know essentially billions, if not tens of billions of dollars of capital uh, decisions just for drilling and completing those wells. So um, the the big factors for why drilling rigs are down, uh, the rig count's down, uh, the CEO of Pioneer, along with se several other CEOs of large independent oil producers, have talked about how their equities, they think, are undervalued, and they're not inclined to increase their drilling activity and drilling investment until their equities, in their view, better reflect the intrinsic value of their assets. And so in, in their view, they'd rather buy back shares and pay dividends than invest in growth because they don't think the market's rewarding them for growth and they think that their shares are too heavily discounted. Um, the other way to think about that is that the cost of capital for oil producers is too high because the shares are so unpopular and the valuations are just too low. Again, from the perspective of the folks who are making those decisions, the board members and the CEOs of these uh, of these companies. So um, I think when you take sort of the combination of those two things, that's the biggest single factor. Um, the second biggest factor is oil price volatility, where when you see the oil price fall $5 in a day, like we saw today, and $10 in a week, it makes it really hard to um, budget 
for capital expenditures. Again, these are expenditures. You you take one rig, you're talking about potentially hundreds of millions of dollars of investment commitment for typically a year. If you try to bring a rig on and take it off and so on, you have substantial productivity losses and efficiency losses. And so you really need to have a rig active uh, consistently in shale to really get your production efficiencies. Ideally, you have your rigs running for years on your assets and you're able to squeeze out all kinds of productivity gains and efficiencies. And so um, you, know, you really need, you need to be able to forecast, but if oil is going to move as much as it has, that actually just increases your cost of capital as well, because you have to add a significant discount factor or risk factor to whatever you're projecting for the price, because you, know, you spend that money and then it takes a number of months before you get any production. And then you know it might take you a year or two or three to get all the money back that you spent for, let's say, running a rig and then completing all those wells and bringing them on in a year. And so um, that extra risk is really, I think, affecting, um, affecting development too. And then the third thing is that as well productivity gains have diminished, there's less of an incentive. It, it sort of comes hand in hand with there being less high return drilling inventory, as well as fewer sort of new discoveries in the US in shale. And so all of that combined leads to just less, there's less of a need for these companies to go and accelerate development like they felt a decade ago when everything was getting better and every incremental well was better and you were just so excited to show that to your shareholders and the market, and you know, if you were private equity back to show it to potential buyers, it's it's just a different environment. And so, in this sort of more stable well productivity or even declining productivity environment, I think there's a big incentive to to invest less rather than more, and to try to generate as much free cash flow and getting back to that high cost of capital point, um, you know, a lot of these companies would just rather keep their production flat or grow very slightly and then return capital beca because of all the uncertainty, because of their high cost of capital um, and because of various other factors. You know, you know, you mentioned Josh, the, I guess the, what, what was the point you, you said, you said that it's the unpopularity of the shares right now. That's one of the things that contributes to the high cost of capital. Where do you see that going as far as influence in the future? I mean, to say, you know, there's a lot of pressure on oil companies, um, you know, to go more green, not just in the States, but overseas too, um, you know, because there's, you know, just that cultural push for us to become cleaner in the use of energy. Do you see that as having a overall um, a negative effect on future oil prices or positive? Like, where, where do you see that influencing it in the future? Ironically, the ESG impulse, the divestment, all these green programs, they're terrible for the environment because they sort of push activity to places where there's fewer regulations. And, you know, you go from relatively clean, low emission oil and gas fields in the US and Canada to extremely dirty, observably dirty, high emission fields in Russia or offshore West Africa or offshore Brazil or so on, where you can see, or Venezuela, where you can see huge spills and oil sheens and you can read reports. I mean, they don't even report on it anymore, but there's still ongoing unfortunate violence in places like Congo and Nigeria and so on. And, you know, uh, having high barriers to investment and development in the U.S. means that you sort of force capital away from the U.S., away from drilling in Texas and Oklahoma, places where we really carefully monitor activity and prevent those sorts of spills and emissions and so on, and force that activity overseas. Um, where, where that activity is going overseas, it's diminished relative to what you would experience if it was happening here in Texas, for example. And so what you end up with is uh, lower supplies, which leads to higher price. And all of the pushes towards moving towards electric vehicles and so on. Um, you know, I posted this on on Twitter recently. People didn't like it, but it's it's the reality. And and it was interesting because no one could no one could come back. They had statistics, but they couldn't actually show the opposite. Um, it, one of my friends was in Rome recently, and he took some pictures of the empty. Uh, parking spots for electric vehicles and all the other spots were full and double parked and whatever. I guess the city really heavily enforces people parking normal cars and electric vehicle spots, uh, which must be what's going on because they're not enforcing clearly the double parking or the other other issues. 
And so, you know, I think I think there's this problem, which is even when you get people and you force them to buy electric vehicles, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to use them. And so we're in this sort of weird situation where, you know, the electric uh, vehicle manufacturers, other than Tesla, you know, their stocks are in free fall, the manufacturing by a number of the large uh, auto manufacturers, they're, they're in many cases cutting back on their electric vehicle manufacturing because it's so uneconomic. Um, you know, the, the wind uh, providers and the partnerships that owned, own giant uh, wind farms are, um, you're seeing their shares collapse as interest rates rise. And it turns out that they're actually not generating the profits that uh, folks underwrote to plus their cost to borrow to buy more and to finance their existing ones is uh, skyrocketing and similar issue on the solar side. So it's just I think there's sort of this uh, dream and then we tried to force it with cheap money and subsidies and so on. And it's just it's just not there. Um, so, you know, I, I I think so far it's actually been this green impetus has actually been very um it's not been great for oil jobs or for the US economy but it's been very very good for the price of oil and for the profits of producers who are able to benefit from less uh less production and uh more limited global supplies. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting perspective you have on that. I remember back pr just prior to COVID, I remember watching CNBC and I think Jim Cramer was on there saying oil companies are done. He's like, they're done. And then, you know, it's like, well, what do you mean they're done? You know, you can't shut down all the oil companies. And I mean, you could you could shut down tobacco companies and we could still survive, but you can't shut down all the oil companies. I mean, there's it's no way we'd be able to keep functioning. And uh, and then like 10 months later, he's telling everybody to buy Chevron. You know, so it was kind of it's just interesting. It's almost like this this uh, split personality that that Wall Street has with stuff. Um, well, it's not just Wall Street, right? It's also, I mean, you see these just stop oil producer or protesters, sorry, wearing clothes made out of petroleum products, right. wearing makeup made out of petroleum products, using petroleum based paint and glues and other stuff in their protests. And then recently, there have been pictures circulating of folks in just stop oil t shirts on planes that are using jet fuel to get places. And there, there'll be all kinds of sort of very, um, you know, uh, there, there'll be explanations for this and excuses, but there's a reality, like you're saying, I mean, it's really hard. You can't really, you could shut it off, but you would kill way more people than sort of the worst case scenarios for uh, climate disaster or what have you. And so it's sort of, I mean, there, there's, I think a real, I think from a policy perspective, there's a real discounting problem where folks are are taking projections that are worst case projection, projections for, let's say, 100 years into the future, and they're not discounting them at all, and then trying to apply them and ignoring all of these people in usually, unfortunately, very poor countries who are hurt today by them. And so there's this very big mismatch in calculations. And so I think it's possible to be an environmentalist and want the world to be a cleaner, safer place um, from a lot of different perspectives to want more equality and to want more, but and also be very pro oil and gas development, particularly in the US and Canada. And so I think I think there's sort of room to feel safe within that in terms of making the world a better place while also investing in oil and gas and allowing the development of it. And you know, I think it's very unfortunate that it became this sort of weird, contentious thing. And ironically, right now, you know, ignoring the <laughs> down move today, but sort of this general revaluation up of oil and and there's likely move much higher in oil prices i mean it's sort of uh, an unfortunate uh, unnecessary policy failure that again is sort of divorced from a uh, utilitarian perspective of doing the most good for the most people well what, you know you mentioned the rise in oil prices that is coming uh, we've talked about that to to some degree and you accurately predicted the one that occurred this year um which again you know uh Congrats to you for doing that. I mean, a lot of people were calling for oil prices to keep falling, and you you called it correctly. Where do you see prices going ultimately? Let's say in a year to two years. I know you said your crystal ball is broken right now, but um, if you could give maybe your best assessment guess, um, just to like give it a perspective of where you think oil prices will be in a year or two years. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think there's a good shot that we get oil again, subject to there not being uh, a hard uh, economic landing. I think there's a good shot that we get oil to all time highs. And I'm not saying that we'll necessarily stay there, but um, I think even on an inflation adjusted basis, when you look at sort of where supply is supposed to come from and then what's actually showing up and then you look at how much demand is showing up as we still have places that are reopening from COVID, you're still seeing demand uh, rebounding in China and then certain sort of uh, countries that were beneficiaries of China and travel destinations from China and so on, as well as seeing this rebound in in uh, flights, which we still haven't sort of fully experienced because of um, a number of uh, flight routes that were eliminated, a number of uh, positions for pilots and uh, flight attendants and so on that were eliminated. We're still rebuilding that. So we haven't even gotten back to where we were in 2019. So as that happens, and then as we surge way beyond that, um, which is just sort of the natural order of, of global consumption of oil, even with this shift towards electric vehicles, um, as that happens, there's just not enough available supply. And then um, to the extent that we're right that Saudi Arabia maybe has 10 million barrels a day they can produce comfortably rather than the 12 to 13 they claim. Um, and then, you know, they can produce 12, but it's very damaging for their fields. And we see historically every time they've produced, let's say, 12 million barrels a day, they almost immediately go down to 10 or lower and have various excuses for it. And, you know, I'm glad that they cut right now uh, because it's helpful for sort of stabilizing the market today. And it's incentivizing some incremental drilling activity versus what we'd see if they hadn't cut. But um, you know, I think some of it is uh, some of it is uh, engineering driven. And having shared our, our thesis on that, we've gotten a lot of feedback from uh, oil field services uh, folks, from engineers and geologists, and so on, who have worked on some of these fields. Again, not just Saudi Arabia, but Kuwait and various other places. And they actually think that it's worse <laughs> than we thought. And they think there's actually a lot less incremental supply. And then some of the folks they're right now offering. Um, rigs and other stuff offshore in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. And it's bizarre. You're seeing rigs go from the North Sea where they're designed to be able to deal with 50 foot waves and freezing temperatures. And they're getting deployed <laughs> in the, um, you know, in the Gulf in a spot where there's essentially, you know, there might be five foot waves if there's a big storm. Um, but there, there's certainly no, no snow. Um, and, and certainly you don't need all of this expensive stuff that that's built out for these harsh environment jackup rigs and so on, and, and they're getting deployed to Saudi Arabia, and you can see some of the incremental production from these offshore rigs, and it's very low. And so there's this narrative of sort of the Texas uh, was it the um, Beverly Hillbillies where they shoot the ground and oil shoots right. out, and people still think for some reason that's the Saudi oil field situation. And the reality is apparently sort of the opposite, where they're spending all this money for small amounts of incremental production offshore, um, with crazy stories in terms of high water cuts and other sorts of issues on these fields. Um, so yeah, I think I think we can get. Uh, sorry for that tangent. But I, I think we can get to all time high oil prices. I think we could get to prices that are almost embarrassing to say. And again, that's driven by um, the very low uh, elasticity of demand from price for oil. So there's high elasticity of demand. So demand falls easily when there's an economic downturn, which is why I'm so focused on that. That's sort of, I think, the big caveat. I think if there is a downturn, by the way, we'll just have less investment and then we'll have a problem, let's say, five years from now or three years from now. And you know, I think the equities are so cheap, it makes sense to have exposure, even if there is a risk of a downturn. Um, but um, you know, if there isn't, then I think there's a real there's a real risk that um, we see prices that just go to the point where we see demand destruction. And we haven't talked about it, but global refining is oversupplied right now. It's not undersupplied. There were lots of narratives in the last couple of years with the shutdown of certain exports from Russia and certain other spots, as well as the restart of refineries, which led to lots of fires and downtime and explosions and so on at various North American and international refineries, and with the surge in natural gas prices in Europe, which really affected the refining margins for European refineries, you had this sort of like perfect storm where refining margins were really high, which sort of forced the 
end price for gasoline and diesel to consumers to really high prices. As those margins have been coming back down recently, it's sort of freeing up extra space for higher gasoline prices from higher oil, not from higher refining margins. So we tested close to $200 oil last year, and we saw about 1% demand sort of uh, impact, plus or minus a little bit, maybe it was 2%, but it was pretty, pretty low. Um, if, if you get into a situation where you need a, let's say, 3 to 4% demand impact, and um, if the dollar falls, the dollar has been very strong recently, and you know maybe it'll continue and maybe not. But in a scenario where the dollar falls, you could end up seeing, um, if you needed to have this sort of, let's say, 3 or 4% demand impact, I mean, you could see well over $200 a barrel, and you could even see well over 300 And again, it's just a question of who's not going to take their crops to market, who's not going to drive their kids to school, who's not going to get on a plane. And the the incremental cost is so low relative to, you know, if gasoline costs twice as much, maybe you'll drive a little less, but most people for most uses won't. And it's just, it's just such a small expense relative to everything else. And then I guess just the last point is, um, Gasoline prices are very low if you exclude taxes. There's huge taxes that have been put on uh, on the gas pump in places like California and Europe and Canada, really, really high taxes. Um, but if you exclude those increased taxes in the last decade or so, and you just look at the, the delivered refined price plus moderate taxes, um, you're basically at a lower price for gasoline right now than you were at in, let's say, 2007. And so what else in your life costs less? What other consumer good, the non-electronic consumer good, costs less than it did in 2007? And then how much more does your rent cost? Does your house cost? Does your car cost? Does your toothbrush cost? Does your you know, food at the grocery store cost? And so when you think about all that, you, you, there's room for it to be, let's say, three times more expensive. And it would just have increased in line with all these other items that everyone grumbles about and is alarmed by and then just goes ahead and pays because they have to in order to to function. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the taxes making the price of gasoline so much higher. I remember, you know, I'm old enough to remember the price of gas back in the 1990s driving through, you know, a lot of the South. And I think it was less than a dollar a gallon. I, I, I seem to recall it being like 70 or 80 cents a gallon. And I remember talking to, you know, friends about that and saying, you know, if we eliminated the gas tax and lifted the sanctions in Iraq, we'd have like 25 cents a gallon. It would be like back in the 1950s prices. But uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because you're right that once we get to a certain point, demand destruction will essentially reduce or will help reduce you know, some of that, some of that price pressure if, if prices get that high. But yeah, I would think at 200 to $300 a barrel, people will, will start trying to figure out ways to carpool or, or make that go further. But, but you're also right about the fact that it isn't, you know, what can you buy today? Like you said, aside from electronic goods that are cheaper than they were in the past, very little, most of the stuff we pay for is more expensive. Um, and speaking of that, very like, Thinking of this in terms of prices being higher, where would you invest? So again, we're not giving fan financial advice necessarily here to individual people. We're not telling them to buy individual stocks or ETFs. Uh, but a lot of our viewers are active or veteran military, and they don't necessarily have um, sector uh, funds in their retirement plan. <clears throat> they don't necessarily have like specialized funds to put their money in. They're just generally broad based index funds, uh, to diversify a little bit, or if they wanted to get involved in energy, if they wanted to have some money in energy, are there any particular ways that you would recommend? And we could say either ETFs, companies, you know, foreign or domestic. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Josh? So first of all, for anyone listening who is a active or former service person, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, both of my grandfathers were uh, in the military and fought in World War II. My younger brother was in the military, went to the Coast Guard Academy. Um, you know, 
really appreciate it. And it's very, you know, it's one of those things where I think people do jobs similar to oil field services, where it's just so important and so thankless. And so I think it's important when someone does you a service, even if it's not directly to you, it's important to be thankful. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, this isn't, I, I'm going to share sort of how I think about it rather than what people should do and sort of how I've thought about positioning money that I manage professionally. Um, and, and this isn't a solicitation, frankly, you know, we manage money for ultra high net worth individuals and family offices and have managed money for endowments and so on. So it's sort of, it's different, but I think sort of potentially relevant for thinking about how to, how to invest. So I like investing in places that um, that professional money isn't really going. I like <laughs> when, when the whole crowd is going one way, I like to go the other way. That's a, you know, the bison face into the storm, you know, there's a storm, all the other animals run the other way and we face into it. Um, on an individual company basis, it's sort of similar um, for people that follow me on Twitter or, or look at some of the articles that we'll share and some of the companies that we buy. Um, generally, I like companies where they're hated. And so when, when there's sort of this like emotional negative reaction from a large portion of the market or of people that feel compelled to reply uh, to stuff. So for me, I, I really like that because the Buffett says and various others say, you know, in the short term, the market is a voting machine and in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And so I like when everyone's voting one way, at least I know <laughs> what I'm buying is not particularly popular. So I have a decent shot if I do a good job or even an adequate job of weighing it. Um, and, and I'm right in my assessment, then I can do really well. So when there's a lot of people doing something, when I feel comfortable, that's always scary. And that's always sort of the lead up to, to me losing money on a position or in a sector or so on. And then um, from an individual company perspective, I think I think selecting individual stocks without doing it professionally is very um, is very fraught with risk. It's hard enough to do well as a professional investor, where literally all you're doing is that, and you have lots of resources and investment banks that provide research and various other folks that provide it, and and you're demonstrably good at it. Even then, most active investment managers actually underperform the market. It's like part of why I'm so proud of how well Bison has done versus. Um, oil and gas uh, indexes since we launched eight plus years ago, um, but it's really rare and really hard to do. And so it's even harder for individuals to to do well than it is and ignore your friends stories about I did this and that and whatever. Most of that's just nonsense. People talk about the, they, they love want to, we have uh, weird uh, psychological effects where we remember the things that are good and we try to forget the things that are bad and we have loss aversion. And um, so uh, your, your buddy that's saying they're making all this money day trading stocks, maybe they are, but probably not. And even if they are, there's a good chance that they'll then lose a lot of the money that they said that they made. Um, and they may or may not tell you and they probably won't. And so, um, you know, just be really, really careful. So I'll, I'll still share like what I'm doing. It just, I, I just think it's really important to, to share that. So I like these smaller oil and gas stocks that most institutional investors can't buy because they're they're too small for them. Um, I like where when I share an idea, people hate it, um, where they'll make up stuff about the companies where like you, know, you can look at their audited financials and go visit their fields and people say, oh, there's no oil there. And you go visit and there's oil there and you meet the midstream people who are transporting the oil and they say, oh, there's not and it's there. So I really like where I can sort of have a variant view that gets validated. Um, and then the, the most interesting thing I found is there are companies where sometimes they'll own other things in addition to sort of their main business and they'll typically only get valued in the market for their main business and even then if they're engaging in other activities they might get a big discount for their main business and so one one example there's this company sandwich i still own it but um you know when i i started buying it in size during COVID at a much lower price they owned an office building in oklahoma city and their stock at one point was trading for around the value of the office building in Oklahoma City, but they were losing money on that building because they weren't really renting it out and it had high taxes and operating costs and so on. And so you can look at them on their cash flow and they were heavily discounted ver versus other oil and gas producers, but they also had this building, which again, it was hurting their cash flow. So it made their oil and gas properties look less valuable, but 
it was worth, you know, pre-COVID over $100 million. They ended up selling it in May of 2020, I think for $55 million, something like that. They got actually, I mean, it wasn't a great price, but, you know, their, their stock at the time was around, I think it got as low as 70 or $80 million. And so, and, and they had very little debt. And so you just, <laughs> so I like that sort of thing. And, you know, th there's fewer of those right now, just because there's been this recent upcycle in the last few years post the negative oil price we saw in April of 2020. Um, but there are companies like Journey, which I own, and I just wanted to share a current example. I always feel bad sharing stuff that's in the past without sharing something that, that's relevant and similar. Journey has power generation that they've been building out, and they're doing it in Canada, in a, in a province in Alberta, where they've been turning off coal power plants faster than they've been building solar and wind and natural gas to replace it. And so um, they have their oil and gas production and it's a similar setup where they've been investing in their power generation, but they don't have a lot of cash flow from it yet because they've been buying it and building it, but it's not on. But it's not, there's not like a lot of risk in the sense that they own the turbines. People know they own them. They've already built a small one of these power generators. They have two more projects coming on. One is all permitted and ready to go. The other one is permitted, but they're waiting on some government study that's going to happen next year. But they've spent tens of millions of dollars buying and building and getting these things ready to go. Um, and so people look at that and they say, well, they spent tens of millions of dollars, but they don't have more oil production to show for it. But of course they don't because they didn't spend that money drilling wells. They spent it uh, buying and building this power generation. And so where it gets so interesting is so people, they're, they're valuing it as if it was an oil and gas producer only, which it is a producer and that's where all of their cash flow comes from. And then some, because they're sort of losing money right now on their power business as they develop it. And so you have this sort of, uh, the, the, there's a value investment framework called Good Co, Bad Co, where it's sort of this, this thing where they, people sort of conflate the whole business and really they have sort of two, uh, two businesses ongoing. And, and so you know, similar to owning an office building and having oil and gas properties and getting dinged for it, they have something similar. The, the better part about it is that they actually are a big power user for some of their oil field operations. They pump a lot of water and they re-inject it back into the reservoir in order to sustain their production and keep their decline rates low. And so um, they've actually suffered a lot with high power prices in Alberta. And so they're, that was sort of one of the initial things that got them into building these things is to offset some of their high power cost. Some of it's integrated into their field. Some of it's going to be sold into the grid and then used to offset some of their power consumption. And I think they'll net be a, a producer uh, and, and seller of power next year once these two projects are on. But it's one of those things where people just... There's, I think there's this tendency for everything to be a heuristic, for everything to be sort of just measured like everything else. And if you can get something essentially for free, and my favorite thing is to get paid to get something that's worth a lot. Um, and then just to watch as people just totally botch the valuations. And, you know, there's a, it's a, again, very risky. It's a $300 million market cap. So, you know, super small, illiquid. Um, you know, I own some, I might trade a little and sell some and buy some, whatever, but, you know, I've owned it for, for a number of years and I, I like the team a lot, but that it's just crazy that you can have something that's going to be worth, we put out something, we think it's this power business will be worth, let's say a couple hundred million dollars once it's on and running relative to a $300 million market cap. Maybe we're wrong and it's worth a hundred or maybe it ends up being worth 250, but we, we feel good. There was a recent transaction that implies about a 200 million value. Um, but it's certainly not a negative, let's say $70 million value, which seems to be how the market's valuing it right now, because they're punishing them for spending this money on power gen instead of drilling. So that's an example. I really like these sorts of things. People hate it. There's these various anonymous posters on Twitter and other places. Oh, you're wrong and stupid. And you're clearly getting paid. And none of the, I mean, hopefully none of those things, I'm definitely not getting paid by them to do anything. Um, but that, I, I like that sort of setup, right? Like eliciting those sorts of negative, that, that that's helpful for me in terms of you get to see what they actually say and if there's something you miss and then um, you get to see the sort of extreme negative emotions. Uh, one of these guys, they got on a call 
The CEO uh, did a call for retail investors last year, which I like. I like when management teams are humble enough to be willing to sort of open themselves up to many people and not know. And the, this guy like was <laughs> calling them names and stuff on an open call that was just, it was oriented towards letting people understand what was going on. So, you know, that's that's not it sounds horrible but it's actually very promising right when people are or sandridge where it had gone bankrupt and four ceos ago people hated the ceo and they still kept associating this again pre-bankruptcy four ceos ago founding ceo they associated this post-bankruptcy totally different entity controlled by carl icon liquidated most of the properties that people didn't like sold the building had net cash and they were still calling it names and mad that this guy had fired their whomever or you know um so that's that's i think my favorite setup these sorts of just weird emotional disassociations along with math problems that are not what like it's it's not even complicated it's just algebra instead of pre-algebra. And so if you can just do that extra little bit, and again, th there's risks with this sort of thing. You can get sort of into too complicated situations. You can mess up pretty big. If something's not generating cash flow, sometimes it never will. It can end up being a big liability. There can be other issues, all kinds of risks and uncertainties. But that's the sort of thing. I think when you can find something that's just so hated, um, and, and be able to actually do the work. And, and again, this sort of framework, there's a number of different value investing frameworks. Value investing is very out of style. Small caps and micro caps are very out of style. Um, and you know, I think, I think it does make sense to the extent one is interested in these sorts of things to spend time and learn how to do it. But this is, I think it's gotta be my favorite framework, which is just business that's losing money temporarily, that's good, uh, stuck in with the business that is, you know, fine. And people just think that the business that's fine is terrible because it's losing money because of this other thing. And, you know, when you, when you do the work and then, you know, assuming the company navigates it well, um, there's huge value that can get unlocked. And then, you know, that sandwich right? people were talking about going bankrupt, the stock was at 70 cents and it's at $15 has paid, I think two fifty a share or so in dividends. Um, and, uh, has not gone bankrupt <laughs> and still has, I think, four or five dollars a share of cash. And they're looking at buying assets and, you know, just very sort of weirdly stable situation that should have zero emotion associated with it. And people still hate it. Um, so I still own it because, you know, when people stop hating it, maybe I'll, you know, think about selling it and, and redeploying the capital, maybe after they buy some assets and maybe the stock is at 30 or 45 or something instead of 15. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the sort of, it's sort of this like channeling people's hate and negative emotions along with, you know, some degree of complexity of analysis, but not, I think, too much along with some variant view. You know, people said nonsensical things like, oh, Oklahoma City office buildings that aren't, you know, the A-rated properties are not worth anything. <laughs> it's like, well, here's... 10 sales comps that say that they're worth a lot. So that's wrong. And, you know, we were wrong when the price is 55 and not, you know, a hundred, but it was 55 and not zero or negative 20. And similar thing, I think for the power gen where, you know, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's 200, maybe it's 300, but it's somewhere sort of in there. And there's a transaction that just happened that it implied 200 and, you know, I'll, I'll take it. And it's, there's a clear trajectory towards those assets coming on. And then if no one, if they never sell it, they'll just flip from using a lot of cash to generating a lot of cash and, um, you know, allowing people to see sort of the value that they've uh, unlocked. And then also just suddenly people will say, wow, what a great oil business that generates all this extra cash and has better margin. It's like, well, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. They were just using the money to spend on this other thing. Um, so long answer to a short question, but that's the sort of thing I really like. And and then I guess just the last point, you'll notice a lot of that's not really tied to oil or natural gas, right? Like it helps that oil is higher. Journey, for example, makes more money. Sandwich makes more money at higher oil, higher natural gas. But um, those theses are not really dependent on higher prices for the stocks to go up. They can do fine under a variety of commodity price assumptions and scenarios. And then companies like Journey, where they're investing in 
uh, power generation, they're actually vertically integrating and reducing the likely future volatility of their cash flow. And so that actually should improve their valuation over time, where maybe they won't have as much upside from higher oil prices, but maybe they won't have as much downside from lower oil prices because, let's say, 20 or 30 or whatever percent of their cash flow ends up coming from their power generation instead of uh, from oil production. So, so there's different attributes of these things. It's not all about all oil is going to the moon. It's, hey, you know, I'm, I'm bullish on oil, but there's this whole set of companies that are ignored or hated where there are right now tremendous opportunities, particularly small and micro caps, where those sectors sort of in general, those size ranges are very out of favor and where um, there have been fund flows away from them. Yeah, I like how you share, you know, some of the complexity of, you know, evaluating some of these companies and also obviously prefacing it with, you know, don't invest money in individual stocks that you aren't willing to lose. Um, you know, so that really kind of sets the stage for the amount of risk you're taking, but the upside potential, like your own success stories, which are really awesome. Thanks for sharing those. Um, also, I wanted to say, Josh, thank you for spending a lot of your valuable time with, with us, sharing your knowledge on the oil markets, where we see that headed how would viewers reach you? Like if they wanted to follow your work uh, or get in touch with Bison Interests, if they wanted to work with you, what are the best ways to either follow you or to get in touch with you? Um, yeah, so uh, we have a website, uh, bisoninterests.com. And then I'm probably too active on social media. So if you look up Josh Young on Twitter, you can see me post. Uh, I've cut back a lot, but I'll still post a couple of times a day about different things that I'm finding interesting in the oil market or about you know companies that I've talked about publicly before. Um, so those are probably the two two best ways to, to follow me. Okay, great. So I will make sure to post links to both your X slash Twitter account and then also to uh, the website below this. Uh, again, Josh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it'd be great to have you back at some point in the future, uh, but we really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. Thank you so much. And again, to any active or former service members, thank you for your service. And for those watching, thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.